What's going on, everyone? I'm your host, JT, and I'm back to you guys with another episode of the JT Sports Podcast. Let's jump straight into it. Will the Tennessee Titans miss the playoffs? The Jacksonville Jaguars are hot right now. They have won three out of their last four games, including their dramatic 17-point comeback at home against the Dallas Cowboys. Meanwhile, you look at Tennessee right now, they're ice cold. They lost on the road 17-14 to the Los Angeles Chargers. And with that loss, they have now dropped four straight in a row. Mike Vrabel is a fantastic coach. And I think that the Tennessee Titans embody the personality of their head coach better than any other team in the NFL. But I think the Titans are going to miss the postseason. They have way too many injuries that they have to overcome. And yes, Tennessee has been here before. They've been in situations in the past where they had to overcome a lot of injuries to get into the playoffs. But this year is different. Because Tennessee, although they have been able to be competitive against some of the best teams in the NFL, despite not being fully healthy, like they only lost to Cincinnati 20-16, to they took Kansas City into overtime with Malik Willis at quarterback, so this team, they're tough, they're scrappy, you're not going to be able to come in and just push this team around because they're not healthy. They're like that uncle or grandpa that you have in your family that used to serve in the military and they got all these scars and bruises and they got a story for every single one of them. That's the Tennessee Titans. That's Mike Vrabel. This team is tough. We know that. This team is going to be able to hang around with you until the fourth quarter. But the difference between the 2022 Tennessee Titans and the Tennessee Titans teams that we have seen in the past has been... The previous Tennessee Titans teams have been able to win the fourth quarter. It wasn't always pretty, but they have been able to find ways to win games in the past. This year, this year's Tennessee Titans team, they're not all that great at being able to find ways to win games in the fourth quarter when things get tight. Against teams that have a record of 500 or better, The Tennessee Titans are 1-6. The only team with a winning record that Tennessee has defeated this year were the Washington Commanders. This Titans team, not only are they banged up right now, but the Jaguars are just a better football team at this moment. It also doesn't help at the fact that the Jaguars have the arrival of Trevor Lawrence. Now they have the best quarterback in this division. You see... For a while, Tennessee has had the luxury of hiring, of having Ryan Tannehill consistently being the best performing quarterback in the AFC South. And that was even with Deshaun Watson. You couldn't really count him because Bill O'Brien held that team back. So Tennessee had the luxury of the last couple of years of being able to not only have the best coach team in this division, but also the best quarterback in this division. In 2022, though, things have changed. Now Trevor Lawrence and Doug Peterson are in Jacksonville, and they're now figuring out how to win. And when you have a young, talented quarterback like Trevor Lawrence, he's able to help you overcome limitations, and he's able to help you overcome injuries. Not just Trevor Lawrence, but just anytime you have a great young quarterback in general, he's able to help you overcome your shortcomings. Look at Justin Herbert with the LA Chargers. For most of the season, the Chargers were fairly injured. And yet they were still able to stay afloat due to the fantastic play of Justin Herbert. You look at the Tennessee Titans right now, the majority of their best players are are injury reserve. Linebacker David Long, he recently got put on IR not too long ago. Your two talented cornerbacks, Caleb Farley, Elijah Molden, they're on injury reserve. Offensive tackle, Taylor Lewan, he got put on injury reserve really early into the season. And not just those guys on injury reserve, but look at the guys who you have banged up going into this week's matchup against the Houston Texans. Christian Fulton, Traylon Burks, Amani Hooker, Denico Autry, are all questionable for this game against Houston. Not only are they questionable, but Ryan Tannehill is questionable. Now, Mike Vrabel came out and said that 
Ryan Tannehill will be able to play if he is able to go with that ankle injury. And Ryan Tannehill's ankle injury looked pretty bad against the LA Chargers. Like, I have a lot of respect for Ryan Tannehill playing through that ankle injury last week. And Tennessee had no choice but to allow Ryan Tannehill to play through that injury because Malik Willis still hasn't developed. He still has a lot of room to improve. So Ryan Tannehill at this point gives you the best chance to win, and he's not even 100%. Ryan Tannehill is probably 65 70% right now going into their bout against Houston. The Jacksonville Jaguars are going to win this division. Not only are they a more healthier team than Tennessee right now, but they're just a better team than Tennessee. Tennessee in the past has been able to overcome injuries due to great coaching, knowing who they are as a team, and having an identity. And yes, they do still have our identity. We know what this offense is. The heart and soul is Derrick Henry, and their defense is pretty solid at times. Their offensive line, though, has been a disaster. And I just wonder, when you look at their last three games on the schedule against the Texans, the Cowboys, and the Jaguars, outside of that Texans game, I think there's a strong possibility that they lose against Dallas and Jacksonville and their season ends up resulting in them having a losing record. And my prediction for Tennessee to start this year was 8-9. Had questions about their depth. You had questions about how their offensive line was going to perform. And those things are now starting to come into the forefront. And these are now huge problems that the Tennessee Titans have right now. I mean, their best receiver is that tight end they have. That dude's a beast. He's probably having one of the best seasons that we have ever seen from a rookie tight end since Kyle Pitt's rookie season not too long ago. The Jacksonville Jaguars, they're hot. Not only are they hot, but they also have a better team and a lot of confidence. You listen to Tennessee and their post-game press conference after their loss to the LA Chargers, they're not dejected. They still have a lot of fight in them. But they realize that the Jacksonville Jaguars are now starting to close in. They know it. You listen to Bud Dupree. He knows it. They understand the level of urgency they need to have. But they also understand that they have a lot of injuries right now that are working against them. It's really hard for me right now seeing the Tennessee Titans being able to hold on to the AFC South. I don't think they're going to be able to get into the playoffs. Before we move on, if you haven't already and you are new to the podcast, welcome. I appreciate you for tuning in. Make sure that you go ahead and follow us on social media. You can follow me on Twitter at JT Sports underscore underscore. You can follow me on Instagram at JT Sports underscore. If you haven't already, make sure that you check out the JT Sports podcast. Leave us with a five-star review. We would greatly appreciate it. Every single video and episode of the podcast that is uploaded on the channel is available in audio format on all podcasting platforms, Apple, Google, Spotify, Amazon, wherever you get your podcast from, you can find the JT Sports Podcast. If you're enjoying this episode, share the podcast with your friends, family members, and acquaintances. You know, the Tampa Bay Buccaneers, they keep getting worse. Just when I think this team can't go no lower They get that shovel, and they just start digging deeper holes for themselves. They were looking like Santa's secret helpers in this game. You know, growing up, when I was in elementary school, we used to have secret Santa. This is when the teacher used to randomly assign you a classmate to get a gift for, and you had to do it secretly. So you would bring the gift in, give it to the teacher, and then... On a certain day, the teacher would just pass out all the gifts and you would do it in secrecy. So if you wanted to reveal to the classmate that you got them that gift, you could. But really, it was just supposed to be anonymous. I guess during halftime of this ball game, the Tampa Bay Buccaneers came together and they huddled around. and They said, all right, we're going to give turnovers in the third quarter to these Bengals players. We're going to give them interceptions. And to these Bengals players, we're just going to give them fumbles. 
That's honestly what the second half of this game looked like. This is the worst third quarter of football that I have ever seen in all my years watching football. Pop Warner, middle school, junior peewee, I have never seen this bad of a third quarter from our team ever in football. First, they start out attempting a fake punt. Fourth and one on their opening possession after halftime, by the way, on their own 26. And they're up 17 to 3. And then Gio, Giovanni Bernard. It's nice to see Gio still making plays for the Cincinnati Bengals. Even though he wasn't in their uniform, he might as well have been. Because it looks like he was the only one who didn't know that fake punt was coming. And then this is what blows me the most, right? After the game, a reporter asked Ty Bowles in his post-game presser, did you think in hindsight it was a good decision to go for that fake punt on fourth and one, considering the magnitude of the situation? And guess what Todd Bowles said? He said yes. And I'm just like, bro, what? Fourth and one, you're up 17-3, to your defense is playing great football, Despite what the box score says and what the final score indicates, the Buccaneers' defense was outstanding against Cincinnati's offense. If it wasn't for their five turnovers, I think Tampa Bay not only would have won this game, but they would have won it by a pretty convincing margin. Their defense played well, and yet they put their defense in bad situations time in and time out over and over again because Just when you think things couldn't get any worse after that fake punt, right? They have four straight turnovers right after back to back to back to back to back. I'm not making this up. Like, I had to go back and watch this game because I didn't watch this game. I just saw that Cincinnati came back and I just thought that this was one of your normal comebacks. But no, it wasn't. You have to give a lot of credit to Cincinnati's defense for the adjustments that they made in this game. And I don't want to take anything away from them. But Tampa Bay having five turnovers in one quarter, that is one of the ultimate choke jobs that I have ever witnessed. Todd Bowles and this coaching staff, it's awful. And the only thing that's consistent with Todd Bowles outside of his consistently bad coaching are his facial expressions. You cut to the sidelines or every time they cut to the sideline of Todd Bowles, He has that same look on his face, that same poker face, that same. Y'all know the look I'm talking about. He has it every single time. And after the game, they asked him, hey, Todd Bowles, what was going through your mind after your team turned the football over five straight times? And he said, you know, just had defense got to go back out there and make a play. Just like when the defense goes out there and gives up a touchdown, the offense has to go back out there and score. And I understand that. But if I was Tyler Bowles and I was in his shoes, the first thing that would be going through my head when my team turns football over five times is, hey, nobody's coming over and sitting on the bench. Everybody's standing up. R.P. Mike Leach. Mike Leach had a, there was a game where Mississippi State's wide receivers were just dropping passes. And when they came over to the sideline, Mike Leach took all the chairs, folded them up, and he was like, nope, y'all don't deserve to sit down. Todd Bowles should have done that with this offense. This offense didn't deserve no Powerade, no water, and they damn sure ain't deserve a spot on the bench. They should have been standing up thinking about what they were doing at that moment. Byron Leftwich, Tom Brady, the whole entire offense should have been looking at themselves on the sideline and just, I don't know. But to have five turnovers in one quarter is absolutely ridiculous. Yeah, their uniforms are red and black or red and somewhat gray, but they might as well have just been wearing all red with the pointy Santa hats because they were looking like Santa's helpers out there with all the turnovers they were gifting Cincinnati. I understand it's the holiday season and this is the time of the year where we spread joy and we give out gifts and presents, but I don't think the Cincinnati Bengals Needed five turnovers in the third quarter. I think that Tampa Bay, you needed this win way more than Cincinnati needed it. I'm pretty sure Cincinnati appreciates the generosity, though. 
I'm pretty sure Bengals fans are really happy with the five turnovers that you gifted them and the 34 unanswered points that you allowed them to score due to it. Cincinnati didn't just score 17 on answer that one point. They scored 34 answered thanks to Tampa Bay gifting them five turnovers. And I'm going to say it again. I'm not saying this to take away anything from Cincinnati's defense. Cincinnati's defensive coordinator needs to be a head coach next year. This dude is probably the most underrated defensive coordinator in the league. He makes fantastic adjustments. The Cincinnati Bengals are a fantastic team when it comes to making second half adjustments. You have to give them credit for that. But to have five turnovers in one single quarter is absurd. Absolutely absurd. And I went to the Tempe Buccaneers Instagram page and I went to the comment section just to see what fans were saying and fans really didn't have too much to say. And it's just so disappointing to look at how Tom Brady is going out. I wanted Tom Brady to retire a couple of weeks ago, but now I don't want to see Tom Brady retire because I don't want to see Tom Brady going out like this. I don't want to see Tom Brady going out with Tampa Bay barely winning the NFC South. I don't want to see Tampa Bay and Tom Brady going out getting blown out in the wild card round. I'm somebody who has a lot of respect and admirations for the guys who have put in the time and commitment and who have elevated themselves to the point that they're future Hall of Famers. So to see Tom Brady playing with a coaching staff that's this bad, it really makes me sad. And yes, Tom Brady does deserve a good amount of criticism, but going back and watching these games... Tom Brady isn't as bad as what the media has made him out to be. Is he playing great football? No, but he's not playing bad football. If the offensive line was better, Tom Brady could have had a better performance. Now, Tom Brady had a little bit more speed on him because there was a third down situation earlier in this game when it was like third and three or third and two, and he had a lot of green grass in him. If he just had a little bit of speed... Not only could he have picked up that first down, but he also possibly could have scored the touchdown. But instead, he ends up getting sacked, and Tampa Bay ends up kicking the field goal, which is another thing that many Buccaneers fans had a problem with. How conservative Ty Bowles was in this game. It's fourth and two on the three-yard line of Cincinnati, and he decides to kick a field goal. You have Tom freaking Brady. Tom Terrific, one of the best quarterbacks in the history of the NFL, who is phenomenal in the red zone despite the fact that he isn't mobile, yet you just decide to kick the field goal. Yes, I understand the run game has been abysmal for Tampa Bay all year. Understand that. But it's fourth and two. You're at the two, three-yard line of Cincinnati. You mean to tell me you don't have confidence in Tom Brady in this offense being able to score a touchdown? From that distance, it's just really disappointing when you look at the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. This team continues to get worse and worse and worse. Their last three games, they got to go on the road and play Arizona with no Kyler Murray. You think they should be able to win that game, and I still expect them to win that game. Then they have to play the Panthers and the Atlanta Falcons The playoffs for Tampa Bay pretty much starts this week. For them to get to the playoffs, they have to win out. Because if you lose to Carolina or the Falcons, then you might not control your own destiny. It's really unfortunate to see Tom Brady, if this is his final year, and this is how he goes out, this would be really sad. This part would be a little bit more sad than how we saw Peyton Manning go out in 2015. But the difference is he went out on top, even though he wasn't playing his best football. And that's pretty much the worst version of Peyton Manning that we saw throughout his career, that 2015 version of him. He still was able to get Denver to the Super Bowl. They were led by a great defense and had a fantastic head coach. When you have a aging veteran like Tom Brady, You don't say, hey, Brady, carry us. You should be carrying Tom Brady, not the other way around. The Buccaneers did a poor job of constructing a team that was able 
to be competent with Tom Brady, even with the injuries. Because it's not like the offensive line wasn't a question going into this season. You had one starter from last year retire, and then you lost one, Alex Kappa, to the Cincinnati Bengals in free agency. So you knew that your offensive line was going to have some issues. And yes, you have had injuries on the offensive line. But at the same time, you should still find a way to game plan around that. You have Tom Brady. You understand that this guy doesn't have no wills. He has no mobility. So therefore, the most important thing is making sure that he stays upright. Tom Bowles was asked after the game, what do you have to do to keep Tom Brady upright? He was like, well, it's simple. We got to block better. Well, do it. The dude was getting sacked to hell in the second half of this game. Just absolutely getting crushed, brutalized, beat down. Tom Brady is 45 years old, Todd Bowles. Do something. Don't allow Tom Brady to get hurt. Don't allow his career to end up how Brett Favre's career ended up in that NFC Championship game against New Orleans in 09. I'm not trying to see Tom Brady go out like that. I'm pretty sure none of us want to see Tom Brady going out like that. And what's even more frustrating is that, you know, they asked Todd Bowles, well, was Cincinnati doing anything differently up front that you guys didn't see? Were they stunting more? And Todd Bowles says, nah, they didn't do anything that we didn't see on film. So it's like, okay, if they weren't doing anything that you haven't seen on film, why aren't you able to stop it? You should have just said, you know, they did any, they didn't do anything that we weren't prepared for. We just couldn't stop it. I think that's an indication of bad coaching. If you see something on film that they've been doing all week and they're doing it in the game and you can't stop it, that means that one, you weren't prepared to stop it. Two, you didn't have the right game plan to stop it. And three, you can't stop it. So therefore, you should have just said and answered the question truthfully and said, you know, they weren't doing anything that we didn't see on film. They just were the better coaching staff and they outcoached us in the second half. Todd Bowles is an awesome human being. I have a friend who is really cool with Todd Bowles and his family. He's an awesome person, a great human being, a fantastic leader, but he's not a good coach, at least a good head coach. The defense is going to be fine. The defense is going to be what carries Tampa Bay throughout the rest of the season. Their defense is now starting to get healthy. They were talking about it throughout the telecast, about how they were starting to get a couple of guys in their secondary coming back. So this defense is going to be pretty good by the time we get playoff time, if Tampa Bay even gets to the playoffs. But I think that this defense is good enough to help them win this division. Now, will they be able to pull a rabbit out of the hat in the playoffs? I doubt it. But this team just continues to get worse and worse. And they just keep getting that shovel, digging up holes, and burying themselves even deeper. And you wonder what kind of hole are they going to dig themselves into this week. You know, Todd Bowles talked about Bucks versus Bucks. We got to stop with the Bucks versus Bucks. Well, stop with the Bucks versus Bucks, Todd Bowles. I mean, we talk about it every single week. So help us stop talking about it. Fix it. Same problems every single week for Tampa Bay keep reoccurring. And yet... Are adjustments being made? It doesn't look like it. The Tampa Bay Buccaneers, man, this team just continues to exceed my expectations for how bad they can be with Tom Brady. And I'm pretty sure most of us had our reservations about the Buccaneers and Todd Bowles going into this season, but I'm pretty sure most of us gave them the benefit of a doubt because they had Tom Brady at quarterback. If they were going to have a bad season, we thought that it would happen next year post-Brady if he retired. Not his, not in what potentially could be his final season. There are a lot of Arizona Cardinals fans who have really high hopes that Sean Payton will become their next head coach in 2023. Now, there's been a lot of rumors circulating around when it comes to Sean Payton and his 
future when it comes to getting out of retirement and becoming a, a head coach again in this league. Arizona has been one of the few teams that have been rumored to have piqued the interest of Sean Payton. He also rumoredly has interest in coaching the Chargers. And the Dallas Cowboys are also linked to Sean Payton per reports as well. Now, when it comes to Sean Payton, will he be coaching the Arizona Cardinals in 2023? I doubt it. There are a lot of things that have to happen for Sean Payton to become the head coach of the Arizona Cardinals. The first thing is you got to trade for him because the New Orleans Saints still own the rights to him. He's still under contract with them. So if he does come out of retirement, the first team that will have a, a chance of trying to get him to coach their football team would be New Orleans. And I think that New Orleans probably would be the number one choice over Arizona if it came down to New Orleans and Arizona because New Orleans already has a better and a more complete roster than what Arizona has right now. The only thing that the Saints are really missing or quarterback. Now, is Sean Payton going to be willing to work with the Saints when it comes to them figuring out the quarterback position? I don't know. Arizona, on the other hand, you have a quarterback, but he currently is dealing with an ACL injury, and that's another hurdle that you're going to have to overcome when it comes to landing Sean Payton as your head coach, because yes, Kyler Murray definitely was a quarterback who probably Peak the interest of Sean Payton. He has a lot of upside. He isn't bad. He's a top 10 quarterback in my opinion. Even with how he's played this year, he definitely hasn't played as good this year as he has in the past. But this season, he still played at a pretty solid level. I just think that Cliff Kingsbury and the play calling has held back Kyler Murray and his production. But this ACL injury, if you're Sean Payton now, you're wondering how is this injury going to alter Kyler Murray is he going to come back and still be somewhat the same player or is this ACL injury going to dramatically affect his mobility and is he going to end up being a lesser version of himself post-injury than he was pre-injury you got to ask these questions if you are Sean Payton Sean Payton if he becomes the head coach of Arizona I think he probably goes up to their owner, Michael Bidwell, and says, hey, I'm willing to be the head coach of this team, but I either want to be the general manager or I want to handpick my GM. Is Michael Bidwell willing to give Sean Payton the control that he wants? And is he willing to keep his hands out of the cookie jar? Because Arizona Cardinals fans, you guys know this better than anybody else. Michael Bedwell and Steve Keim, the long-term GM for Arizona, who many people expect Arizona to part ways with after this season. Uh, a couple of days ago, he came out and said that he was going to be stepping down due to health reasons. But prior to the whole situation with Steve Keim, this organization, from a front office perspective, has always kind of had their hands meddling with the affairs of these head coaches in the past okay they're control freaks so if you hire Sean Payton if you're bid well are you going to hire him and say okay Sean I'm going to allow you to do your job and I'm going to keep my hands off things I'm going to stay as far away from things as possible the only time I'm going to be close to the team is when I'm watching the games is he going to be willing to do that and then if you're Arizona you got to hope that the Chargers make it to the playoffs and they keep Brandon Staley and that Mike McCarthy is able to win a playoff game and that makes Jerry Jones content enough to move forward with him as their head coach for the near future. Because if it comes down to Arizona and let's say that Chargers job opens up and that Dallas Cowboys job opens up, I'm pretty sure Sean Payton is going to be choosing the Cowboys or the or the Chargers over Arizona because they already have rosters that are more equipped to win compared to Arizona's. Now, if I had to give you reasons for why Sean Payton could be the head coach of the Arizona Cardinals, it could be that he already has some connections to this franchise in the past. 
He told a story about how he used to serve as like a ball boy for this team. So for Sean Payton, he has a pretty good relationship with the ownership of Arizona. So I think that there is a little interest there when it comes to Sean Payton wanting to coach Arizona. But with the injury to Kyler Murray, if you're him, you're probably asking, okay, what's going to be the timetable for his return? Because it recently was reported that six to eight months is the recovery time for Kyler Murray to heal up for his injury. And we don't even know if he's going to be ready come week one. He might not be ready to go come week five or six of the 2023 NFL season. So if you're Sean Payton, do you really want to go into another situation like you did in your final year in New Orleans where your quarterback situation is a little blurry? Okay, I don't really know if Sean Payton wants to go into a situation like that with Kyler Murray and his health in question. Sean Payton might just want to go coach a team that has a quarterback situation that is a little bit more stable. And Kyler Murray is a really good quarterback. And Arizona has a roster that's pretty solid. Now, it's not as good as the Chargers or the Dallas Cowboys roster. But compared to the rosters that these other teams have that are going to have coaching vacancies, such as the Panthers and the Indianapolis Colts, the Cardinals have way better rosters than those two teams. And outside of the offensive line, this team is pretty solid. Running back is good. Receiver is really good. You're going to have Marquise Brown, DeAndre Hopkins. We're going to see what happens with Robbie Anderson and whatnot. Because I think with Sean Payton, he could be a really good fit in Sean Payton's offense. The Cardinals could be really deadly if they get Sean Payton as their head coach. Will it happen? I doubt it. There's just a lot of things that have to go in Arizona's favor for Sean Payton to become their next head coach. I doubt it happens, but we will wait and see. The last thing that I want to talk about is Bill Belichick. The New England Patriots were defeated by the Las Vegas Raiders in a very embarrassing fashion. And you have to wonder, are the Patriots trending in the wrong direction under Bill Belichick? I believe that they are. Bill Belichick's stubbornness is hurting the Patriots. You see... Going into this season, we didn't even know who the offensive coordinator was going to be. We thought that he was going to end up bringing somebody in, but he never did. He ended up having Joe Judge and Matt Patricia being heavily involved in running the offense throughout the offseason, throughout training camp and whatnot. And then come week one, it ends up Matt Patricia being named the offensive coordinator. And many Patriots fans were skeptical about the decision, but they gave Bill Belichick the benefit of a doubt because it's Bill Belichick. But now when you look at how this season has went for New England, and you look at how last year went for New England, this franchise is not what it used to be. And we're not talking about, you know, losing Tom Brady and whatnot. We're talking about just Bill Belichick. You see... One thing that we used to always say about New England was that they were always really well coached. There were not going to be too many games where you would find New England being out coached by their opponent. But this season, however, it looks like there's been plenty of times where this coaching staff has gotten out coached. And the reason for that is because of Bill Belichick's stubbornness of having the Lil Dirk mentality, keeping it only the family, and only hiring guys who you have close ties to, have a strong relationship with. Bill Belichick, when's the last time he's gone out, conducted a search for a new coordinator position? When's the last time we've heard Bill Belichick go through interviews, interviewing candidates for a new vacancy on his coaching staff? It's been a very long time. When you look at his coaching staff, it's comprised of former players, family members, or guys who Bill Belichick has been coaching with for a very long time. The OTF Bill Bill, Bill, Bill Belichick coaching tree is hurting New England because instead of hiring the guys who are the most qualified 
for these positions, you end up hiring guys who you know the longest. And it's hurting Bill Belichick and it's hurting the New England Patriots. Because think about this. If Bill Belichick retires and the New England Patriots don't win a playoff game, they don't have a Super Bowl, or they don't have any success in general post-Brady, what is going to be Bill, Bill, Bill Belichick's legacy when we look back and reflect on his accolades and his accomplishments? We're going to say, yeah, Bill B was one of the greatest head coaches in NFL history, but if it wasn't for Brady... How good of a coach would he be? And I think now, when you look at Bill Belichick, what I'm about to say is going to be tough, but I think it's really true. I think now, with Tom Brady being out of New England for, what, three years now, I've realized that Tom Brady was Batman. Bill Belichick was Robin. And it's tough because you don't really think of a quarterback head coach situation in that way but I think it was true Tom Brady was the key cog to the Patriots dynasty you look at the Patriots offense this year Mac Jones has taken a step back the offensive line hasn't been good the receivers have been hit and miss outside of Ramondre Stevenson this offense hasn't been watchable they call a bunch of screen plays. They can't generate big plays in the passing game downfield. It's a struggle watching this offense. Now, the defense is still really good and it's playing at a really high level. But outside of that, this offense is abysmal. And Tom Brady was always the key cog to the Patriots' offense being as successful as what it was. Think about it. Throughout the tail end of Tom Brady's Patriots career, he was throwing to worst wide receivers. He went from throwing to guys like Randy Moss and Wells Welker to throwing to Philip Dorsett and Chris Hogan, a lacrosse player. And the reason why the offense was still able to function was because of Tom Brady. Now, you did have Josh McDaniels there, and that did help. But if Tom Brady was still in New England, He would still be balling regardless of who the offensive coordinator was because Tom Brady was the system. You see, Bill Belichick, his system is being conservative and relying on your defense, not turning the football over too much. And yes, taking care of the football, ball control is the name of the game. But at the same time, though, you still do have to be able to keep the defense honest. You just can't be throwing hella screen passes and not taking a lot of shots downfield and not being able to connect downfield when it comes to attacking the defense vertically because then the defense is just going to play up on you all game and they're just going to be like, you know what? There's no reason for us to worry about the deep throws because they can't hit on them. They can't beat us deep. So we can just play up and play these screen passes and play these slants and drags, get them in the third along getting them in situations where they can't run the football, and then get their offense off the field. You look at Mac Jones and the verbal spouts on the sidelines that he's had with Matt Patricia. You know, for Bill Belichick, his stubbornness is really getting in the way of the Patriots' success moving forward. Post-Tom Brady, what has Bill Belichick been? You look at Tom Brady post New England or post Bill Belichick, he has won a Super Bowl. He's been to the playoffs. Meanwhile, you look at New England. Yes, they've been to the playoffs, but when we saw them in the playoffs, they got blown out by Buffalo. You see, Bill Belichick has this team trending in the wrong direction. Because as a Patriots fan, I want you guys to be honest with me real quick. When you compare your future, we're not talking about 2022, we're talking about 2023 and beyond. Compare your 2023 and beyond to the Miami Dolphins' futures, the Bills' futures, and the Jets' futures. Where do you lie in the hierarchy of the AFC East? Where do you think this team is going to be headed at this current trajectory under Bill Belichick in the next four years? 
The Dolphins have Tyreek Hill and Jalen Waddle. It looks like they're going to be a threat for the next couple of years. The Buffalo Bills, as long as they have Josh Allen, they aren't going anywhere. And the New York Jets, if they can finally find a quarterback with that defense and with that young core they have and with the fantastic job that they have done that constructing their roster and hitting on their draft picks, the Jets could end up potentially being a Super Bowl contender down the line if they can find the right quarterback or if Zach Wilson ends up developing. You look at New England, I mean, you don't really know what the future has in store for you. As a matter of fact, you're probably looking at your future in a really negative light because you don't really have as many young promising players as teams as the Miami Dolphins and the New York Jets and the Buffalo Bills. And plus, right now, what, you have the third best quarterback in the division? Which doesn't really mean much because Mac Jones, I still think, is solid. I don't think he needs to be traded. I don't think he's a problem. I don't think the Patriots need to bring in another quarterback. I don't think they need to bring back Jimmy Garoppolo, bring back Tom Brady. I just think that Bill Belichick needs to stop being stubborn, hire from outside of his OTF coaching tree, and find a way to maximize the potential of his young quarterback. Mac Jones can end up being one of the best quarterbacks in this game. He isn't the most mobile, but he has enough athleticism that you have to account for it, and he can pick up a little bit of yardage if need be. He's also really accurate, and he's also really good when it comes to reading defenses most of the times, in my opinion. I think what has hindered Mac Jones has been the coaching staff. And Bill Belichick is a large reason for why Mac Jones' sophomore season has went the way it's went. And it's really disappointing because you expect more from Bill Belichick. And I heard a rumor, I don't know if this is true, but according to some reports out there, some believe that Bill O'Brien could be the Patriots' next offensive coordinator in 2023 if Alabama doesn't bring him back or he doesn't get a head coaching job elsewhere. Bill Belichick... Um, according to this report or this rumor, didn't want to um, offer Bill O'Brien the coordinator job because him and Nick Saban are really tight and they're really good friends. So once again, potentially, we could see Bill Belichick once again keeping it only the family and bringing in somebody else from his OTF coaching tree that... Hasn't really showed that he's a good coordinator or hasn't showed the ability to lead a top offense. And once again, we could potentially see the stubbornness of Bill Belichick hurting the New England Patriots season in 2023. Bill Belichick is still a fantastic head coach. Don't get me wrong. He's still a top 10 head coach. When you look at this offense and how he has mismanaged this situation with the offensive coordinator... I just think that the Patriots under Bill Belichick are trending downwards. They're trending in the wrong direction. This is it for this episode of the JT Sports Podcast. If you guys have made it to the end of this episode, thank you. I appreciate it. Make sure that you guys go ahead, leave a like on the video, subscribe to the channel. Check out the JT Sports Podcast available on all podcasting platforms, Apple, Google, Spotify, Amazon, wherever you get your podcasts from. You can find the JT Sports Podcast, and I will see you guys shortly with another episode of the JT Sports Podcast.